Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I want to call the hearing to order and uh, welcome everybody for joining us. Um, we have an excellent panel here today to, uh, uh, to examine President Obama's proposal to impose per flight user fees on aviation operators. You know, unfortunately, this isn't a new proposal. Previous presidents have suggested a user fee system for aviation uh, in addition to the current taxes and fees that are already levied as a way to bolster the airport and airways trust fund. Fortunately, these proposals have never been enacted, and today we are going to discuss how important um, it is that they never are uh, enacted. In fiscal year 2013, uh, in the fiscal year 2013 budget, President Obama proposed a $100 flight user fee on general aviation operators. Imposing such a plan has a very real potential to stifle the general aviation industry as a whole and harm job creation. The general aviation industry is predominantly made up of small businesses. And annually, it accounts for 27 million flight hours, carries 166 million passengers to around 5,000 communities. And according to the National Air Transportation Association, more than two-thirds of general aviation flights are for business purposes. Overall, general aviation, both operations and manufacturing, employs about 1.2 million people and contributes approximately $150 billion to our gross domestic product. So the bottom line is general aviation is a very significant part of our national economy. The general aviation community has always contributed financially to the national uh, air transportation infrastructure. And since the inception of the Airport and Airways Trust Fund, the general aviation community has paid its share through a 21.9 cent per gallon tax on jet fuel and a 19.4 uh, cent per gallon tax on aviation gasoline, all without the need for a large bureaucracy to collect these taxes from hundreds of thousands of individual pilots and uh, aircraft owners. This is a far more equitable and efficient way to address our aviation infrastructure needs. Imposing a $100 per flight user fee on operators is simply the wrong approach, and the President offered a few, very few details on, uh, as to how such a system would be established and even less analysis on how it would impact the aviation industry. I believe this is very bad policy, and there is little doubt it would stifle job creation and economic growth in the United States. I would also like to remind my colleagues on the, uh, on the uh, committee of the broad and bipartisan opposition from Congress to the President's proposal, and I would ask unanimous consent um, that a letter that was sent and signed by 195 members of Congress expressing concerns uh, be submitted into the record, and without objection, uh, we will do that. Uh, it is so ordered. And again, I want to thank our witnesses uh, for taking the time to be with us today, and I look forward to hearing all of the testimony uh, that we are going to hear today, and I now yield to Ranking Member Velasquez for for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, the U.S. economy is as complex as it is vibrant, requiring frequent travel throughout the nation. For small business women and men, this may mean traveling at the last minute or to remote areas that are not served regularly by commercial airlines. As a result, general aviation and the flexibility it provides plays a key role in our nation's growth. In fact, general aviation directly generated $22.1 billion in 2009 and had an overall p impact of $76.5 billion, employing nearly half a million workers. This contribution will not doubt grow as the economy continues to recover. With this important role in mind, it is critical that we carefully examine any potential policy that could impact this industry and the workers it employs. One such policy is the administration's proposal to levy a $100 fee on takeoffs and landings for commercial airplanes and corporate jets. While all piston and emergency aircraft will be exempt, this new fee structure could create new burdens for the aviation community while requiring a new bureaucracy to monitor compliance. It is important to carefully consider whether the benefits of a new U user fee system outweigh the cost of its implementation. While it is sensible to talk about this user fee proposal, doing so really misses the elephant in the room today. And that elephant is sequestration and the across-the-board cuts on all federal spending that will take effect in January. Estimates show that the FAA stands to lose $1 billion in funding as a result. According to a study by the Aerospace Industry Association, this could force the layoff of almost 1,500 air traffic controllers, nearly 10 percent of the total, 
and the closing of more than 240 airport control powers around the country. Many of these closings will likely occur at smaller airports that handle less traffic, those that are most used by the general aviation community. Additionally, passenger traffic could drop by 10%, causing aircraft manufacturing to fall, costing the economy another 11,000 to 22,000 jobs. So while it is important to discuss the imposition of user fees, it is equally, if not more important, to talk about the effects of fiscal belt tightening on the general aviation industry. This issue is not unique to the FFA or aviation, but it will have to be addressed jointly by the government and the private citizens that rely on those specific services. Whether it is crop insurance for farmers, loans for small businesses, entrance fees at national parks, or traffic control services for pilots and their passengers, reduced federal funding creates difficult choices. Tough decisions will have to be made, and hearings like the one that we're having today can help us de determine what the best solution is. Ensuring that the general aviation industry remains strong in light of these current fiscal challenges is a priority for this committee. It plays an important role in the U.S. economy, particularly for areas that lack other transportation infrastructure, and it is poised to grow stronger over the next 20 years. Through its presence, it it not only creates jobs, but also serves as an economic anchor for many rural communities. I would like to thank the distinguished panel of witnesses for traveling here today, and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thanks, Nidhi. Um, all right, our <coughs> witnesses today. Our first witness is Marion Epps, uh, CFO of Epps Aviation, which is a fixed-based operator uh, based in DeKalb, uh, Peachtree Airport in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Marion joined the family business in 1993 in a marketing role, and in 1995 she was promoted to the position of CFO and elected to the Board of Directors in 2007. She manages accounting operations, information technology. She oversees charter and aircraft management and Pilatus aircraft sales. Uh, Ms. Epps is testifying on behalf of the National Air Transport Association, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, Marion, we appreciate it. Uh, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Velasquez and members of the committee, the National Air Transportation appreciates the opportunity to appear before the committee to discuss the detrimental impact user fees would have on general aviation industry. My name is Marion Epps. I am the CFO of Epps Aviation in Atlanta, Georgia. Epps is one of NATA's member companies and is located at the second busiest airport in Georgia. Our owner and founder, Pat Epps, my father, has come a long way since his father, Ben Epps, built and flew Georgia's first aircraft at the age of 19 in 1907. Pat was the youngest boy of 10 children, eight of whom became pilots. Let's fast forward to 1965 when my father bought a small fixed-based operation at the Cab Peachtree Airport. For 47 years now, EPS Aviation has served the business and public aviation community. We started with 19 employees, two hangars on 21 acres of leased land. Today we have 145 employees, down from a pre-recession high of over 200. Our workforce includes line technicians, AMP mechanics, avionic technicians, and pilots. They serve U.S. and international customers 24-7, 365 days a year. We've made improvements on our 21 acres of lease space, not with government funds, but with company profits. We built a terminal lobby, maintenance facilities, five 10,000 square foot corporate hangars, 40 tea hangars, and a fuel farm. Today, these facilities are home base to over 100 aircraft owners. Many of these aircraft owners are small businesses themselves that use aviation to grow their business, such as a seafood wholesaler, a lighting manufacturer, an industrial packaging company, and a chicken farmer. These small businesses rely on aviation, just like ours, and they have felt the effects of a slower economy. They're struggling to build back to pre-recession levels. So why am I here? The administration has included a tax proposal and a deficit reduction plan that would require all air transportation providers to pay a $100 per flight departure fee. This departure fee would kill small businesses like ours and hurt organizations around the company, the country, that depend on general aviation. Imposing a user fee would also be detrimental to the many states 
with little or no commercial airline service. They need general aviation for economic job growth. Let me give you some more data on why aviation is critically important to our economy. The industry employs 1.2 million workers and generates $150 billion annually in economic activity. And let me tell you why user fees would negatively impact general aviation in the U.S. No doubt many operators would fly less due to the increased cost of using the national airspace system. Less activity will have a ripple effect throughout the industry with many businesses such as ours suffering due to the lower fuel sales, maintenance, and other services. And it would be an enormous administrative burden for both the government and the aircraft operators. Just look at the countries that have a user fee system. None of these countries have the level of aviation activity of the United States. Most bill after flights are conducted for the air traffic services, and their delayed billing systems are error prone, and they cost more to administer than what they collect. Why build a new system when we have one that works? The current fuel tax ensures that the Aviation Trust Fund will receive the appropriate contribution the minute fuel is purchased without having to wait weeks or even months for payment. Let me wrap up by saying that Congress and the aviation industry have been in opposition to any user fee proposals on aviation. Over the past five years, numerous letters from the House and Senate members of Congress, industry coalitions, aviation associations have reiterated that per-flight user fees will cripple the aviation industry and the small businesses it represents. We've seen this happen in other countries. The government's first priority should be to create an environment in which businesses can grow and make more important contributions to the national economy. A user fee is little more than a punitive tax that would have a lasting negative effect on aviation. We all agree that fuel taxes represent the best way for the aviation industry to contribute revenue to the federal government and support efforts to enhance the national air transportation system. We look forward to working with the committee in resolving this issue, and we're eager to serve as a valuable resource for aviation businesses during this debate. Thank you for your time, and I really appreciate being here. Thank you, Ms. Epps. Uh, our next witness is Martha King, who is the co-owner and co-chairman of King Schools, which is a flight training school based in San Diego, California. Um, in business for over 36 years, King Schools focuses on innovative technologies to help train pilots over a wide range of certifications. Uh, Martha is the first and only woman to hold every category and class of FAA rating uh, on their pilot and instructor certificates. Ms. King is testifying on behalf of the National Business Aviation Association. Uh, welcome to the committee, Martha. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Martha King, and I am honored to be here today to represent the National Business Aviation Association, NBAA. NBAA has over 9,000 members and all have one thing in common. They rely on business aviation to meet some of their company's travel challenges. Mr. Chairman, as you say, I am co-owner and co-chairman of King Schools, a flight training company that my husband and I started in 1975. King Schools is a member of NBAA, and I serve on the Association's Associate Member Advisory Council. King Schools grew from its original two employees, my husband and myself, in 1975 to a high of 90 employees in 2007. Like thousands of startup companies all over the U.S., we found that using a general aviation airplane made our company more efficient and more productive. It allowed us to do more in less time. It helped us survive, compete, and grow. Thirty-seven years later, we still depend on our general aviation airplane. Mr. Chairman, as you know, general aviation is one of our nation's most significant industries. It is one of the few U.S. industries that contributes positively to our nation's balance of trade. It is fundamental to our nation's manufacturing base. It employs 1.2 million Americans at a time when our country urgently needs jobs. It is an economic lifeline to thousands of small and mid-sized American communities with little or no scheduled airline service. It helps companies of all sizes be more efficient, more productive, and more competitive. And it is vital to our nation's humanitarian efforts. 
the Great Recession has been devastating to the general aviation industry. By virtually any measure, our industry shrank by 30 to 60 percent. My company is down from 90 employees to 50. It is difficult to imagine how, at a time when a critical American industry is struggling the way that general aviation is, people in Washington could be contemplating an onerous, regressive, and administratively burdensome new per-flight tax euphemistically called a user fee. A $100 per-flight tax on all turbine-powered aircraft would be devastating for thousands of small businesses like mine. And I hope that this important committee will put an end to this nonsensical proposal once and for all. Here are some valuable facts. Most of the business airplanes and component parts flying in the world today were built in the U.S. Eighty-five percent of companies that use business aviation are small and mid-sized businesses. Most business aviation flights fly to or from airports with no scheduled airline service. And the average age of the U.S. general aviation turbine airplane fleet is over 25 years old. Mr. Chairman, I know that there are those who try to promote a caricature of business aviation that is at odds with these facts. But the reality is that my small business is very representative of business aviation in the U.S. Our employees are instructors, technicians, salespeople, and customer service representatives, and these are the people that fly on our airplane. We do not have an army of accountants standing by to process a bunch of $100 per flight invoices from some new Federal bureaucracy. And quite frankly, our country does not need some new Sky RS complete with auditors, billing agents, and collectors. Today, business aviation pays at the pump through a per gallon fuel tax. It is simple. It is fair, it is efficient, progressive, and environmentally friendly, and it is adjustable. Congress can raise or lower the fuel tax. We do not need to establish a foreign-style system of user fees in the U.S. We have a better way. We have fuel taxes. Make no mistake, a new $100 per flight fee on all turbine airplane flights is a bad idea. It will hurt our economy, our transportation system, and small towns. And it will hurt small businesses like mine. We are counting on this committee to make sure that does not happen. We are counting on you to spread the word that aviation fuel taxes work and per flight fees destroy. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is my pleasure to introduce our witness, Kenneth Button. Button. Sir? Thank you very much. Uh, no, no, let me uh, properly uh, introduce you to the committee. He is a university professor of public policy at George Mason School University, where he is the director of the Center for Transportation Policy, Operations, and Logistics, as well as the director of the Aerospace Policy Research Center. He has published or has impressed some 80 books and over 400 academic papers in the field of transportation, economics, aviation policy, and related subjects. Professor Button is the editor of numerous academic journals in the fields of aviation and aerospace policy, tourism, and transportation. Prior to coming to G George Mason University in 1997, he served as a transportation ex expert for the OECD and taught at several universities around the world. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, and I'm very uh, grateful you invited me to talk. Um, let me give my conclusions first. Um, there seems to be two separate issues here. First of all, whether user charges are a good thing. I actually disagree with the chairman on this. I think there should be a move towards user charges in aviation. I believe they should be genuine user charges, which I would call a price. Uh, basically, user charges are a price for doing something. Secondly, on the issue of whether one wants to simply add an extra charge to 
the existing fuel charges and whether this particular charge is an ideal way of doing it, I must confess I do have some reservations. The first point, pricing is very effective for three reasons. It allocates out the facilities you've got to the people who make the best use of them. It allocates out those facilities to the people who are willing to pay and thus presumably make the largest financial return from using them. In other words, the business people who are the most efficient. Secondly, you collect revenue from this which is directly related to use. Fuel charges are not directly related to the use of the system. And this direct relationship allows the FIA and other bodies to decide where new investments required or where certain types of facility may be uh, truncated. And thirdly, it provides a stream of revenue which is independent of any form of taxation, uh, which allows the body, the FIA in this case, to actually provide uh, additional capacity and to finance it. That is why a lot of countries have moved towards user charges. The user charges have had some problems where they've been introduced. Uh, the reasons for this are partly uh, the, the nature of the, the charges. They've not been imposed particularly well. There's been a certain experimentation involved. But of course, the United States is at an advantage here, can learn the lessons from elsewhere. So I'm very much in favor of user charges. I don't think they pose the problems which we sometimes hear. These particular charges which are being proposed here, I think one has to look at them fairly carefully. I think there is a need um, to remember that uh, general aviation does use the infrastructure in the same way as commercial aviation. It does not pay as much for using that infrastructure, but on the other hand, it doesn't necessarily use all of that infrastructure. It doesn't need everything large commercial aircraft do. So there are some issues about a flat charge across everything because users of the system use different amounts of it. This particular charge, I think, has got some, some issues that need to be looked at. I do agree we do have to raise some additional revenue. The air transport system does need additional money. I do believe this small debt which has been uh, accumulated in the United States of getting on for $17 trillion has to somehow be paid down. It has to be paid down, I think, so it's not a burden on future generations, but also we don't have the burden as the economy recovers of higher interest payments on it. Inevitably, interest rates will go up as the economy recovers. Somehow that has to be paid for. My concern about this particular charge is it has been floated as a form of trying to help pay off some of the national deficit. According to my calculations, if this is the sole source of money, it would take something over 13,000 years to actually pay off the national deficit, assuming there's no interest on that deficit. So I think putting it forward as a method of paying off the de deficit is inappropriate. Um, secondly, it's been put forward as a method of getting greater equality. My view is we should have equality as much between generations as between groups at the moment. Therefore, I think we need user charges which ensure the aviation industry in this country, being at large commercial undertakings, general aviation, business aviation, flying schools or whatever, are efficient in what they do. That they have the appropriate facilities provided to them, they pay the appropriate, and I'll use the word again, the appropriate price for that infrastructure, and that infrastructure has a viable method of funding. I have some reservations, therefore, about this particular proposal, although I do have considerable sympathy with the underlying idea we have much more efficient user charges on aviation, or pricing as aviation, as I like to say. I have written, uh, provided some written testimony, and clearly I provide a very short summary of it. Thank you. <coughs> Rounding out our panel today is Brad Pierce, who is the president of Restaurant Equipment World, um, REW, in Orlando, Florida. Uh, started by Brad's father, Jerry, in 1976, REW remains a family-owned and operated company that sells professional-grade kitchen equipment for both their showroom in Orlando uh, from both their showroom in Orlando and across the world uh, online. The company currently employs 50 uh, individuals and is testifying on behalf of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, Mr. Pierce, we appreciate it. There you go. Thank you. Well, it is certainly an honor to be speaking with you here today. I'm here today representing the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, also known as the AOPA. We have been an AOPA member since 1997 and are also proud to be a member of the National Business Aviation Association. Restaurant Equipment World was founded more than 35 years ago by my father, Jerry Pierce. We provide restaurant and food service equipment throughout the Southeast and beyond from our headquarters in Orlando, Florida. We are proud to 
have approximately 48 employees. And through our efficiencies, we have sold products to more than 100,000 customers in all 50 states and more than 110 countries internationally. My testimony today will make three points. Number one, general aviation has been a critical factor for the growth of our business and has given us important competitive advantages. Number two, general aviation users pay to fund the aviation system through excise taxes on fuels. The system is effective, it is proven, and should continue to be the means by which users pay into the system. Number three, user fees would be devastating to, business, to businesses like myself that depend on general aviation. General aviation grows businesses. Restaurant Equipment World depends on it each and every day to conduct business. We currently fly a turbo Cirrus SR-22 aircraft, and we have a deposit placed on a Cirrus Vision jet, which will be the fourth business aircraft uh, for our company. I consider my airplane to be one of my best employees. It has consistently allowed me to expand our boundaries and our service area because it allows me to reach our potential clients fast, even when they are located hundreds of miles away. I have personally flown our business aircraft to 49 states in an effort to maintain existing relationships, attend industry events, and pursue new business for our company. Our airplane allows us to control our own travel schedule, so we are able to stay on site with our customers to make sure that our interactions are complete and that they are satisfied with the services that we have provided all the while not needing to worry about cutting things short, catching a commercial flight. As recently as two weeks ago, our aircraft allowed me to shift my travel schedule in order to meet a new client, as well as being able to make an impromptu visit to a manufacturing partner on my way to an industry event. On more than one occasion, our planes provided us a competitive advantage, of allowing us to move very, very quickly. Uh, we had a call from a potential client up in North Carolina. I was able to arrange a meeting in a matter of hours, something that would have taken me two full days back and forth on a commercial airliner. We arrived faster than even their local competition, and we got the contract. Our airplane allows us to meet multiple customers in multiple cities and multiple states in a matter of a single day. We can respond quickly to our customer needs, we can build relationships with them, and we can help our customers grow their businesses and many of our customers are small businesses themselves. Both senior management and my rank-and-file staff members utilize our aircraft as an important tool to serving our customers' needs. And I am not alone. In my home state of Florida, for example, general aviation is associated with more than 7 million jobs and has an estimated economic impact of $7.5 billion. That is because thousands of other business owners, just like myself, use general aviation to grow their companies. The current recession has been a challenge for restaurant equipment world. In order to survive and thrive, we have had to be laser focused with efficiency. We can't just throw money wildly at, at problems and opportunities. We need to be there for our customers now more than ever. At a time when we have seen multiple competitors failing, we have been able to grow our business and been able to continue hiring employees. General aviation pays at the pump. Every general aviation operator pays to support the aviation infrastructure every time we fly through an excise tax on fuel. This tax has been an effective way of paying into the system since the earliest days of powered flight. It directly reflects how much we fly because we are taxed on the amount of fuel that we use. The current system requires no additional bureaucracy or administrative costs for either the system users or the Federal Government, and Congress sets the tax rate. It is within your ability to adjust the rate as needed. The $100 per flight fee would require a new system just to administer and collect this tax. And once the bureaucracy was in place, that fee could be changed at any time without congressional input or oversight. For business owners like myself, there would be an additional cost just to reconcile and pay these resulting invoices. Today's system of excise taxes works. Creating a new type of tax would increase costs and decrease efficiency for everyone involved. The proposed $100 per fee flight, flight fee would be devastating to small businesses like my own. Adding an additional $100 to cover every flight would impact how many clients we could go and see, especially in rural areas where it just simply would not be worth stopping for that extra dollar, $100 fee that is imposed. Our business depends on being responsive to our client needs and building relationships in person. This fee would absolutely devastate that, and our value proposition would change dramatically. 
In conclusion, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here before you today, and I urge you to reject new taxes in the form of user fees for general aviation. General aviation has made it possible for us to grow Restaurant Equipment World from a five-person company to one with approximately 48 employees today. We want to continue to create jobs, but we need general aviation to be able to do it. Allow us conti to continue to pay at the pump so we can focus our energy on making our business stronger instead of paying new fees. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Thanks, Mr. Pierce. I will now go with questions, and I am going to turn to Mr. West uh, to start us off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. And uh, in full disclosure, I want to say that the, the wings on my lapel are represented the fact that I failed the Army uh, aviation test, and so I got into the line to be a paratrooper. That was a lot more simpler. Um, now, with that being said, uh, Dr. Button, you said something in your oral testimony. You said that fuel charges are not directly related to use. So, I mean, to me, you've got to have fuel to, for an aircraft to take off. So, I mean, fuel charges have to be directly related to you. So, in a way, we are already talking about a user fee that is being paid by these users of the aviation uh, you know, assets. Why do we need to go to a $100 user fee? Well, and you just debunked the whole thing about the debt and deficit. So, can you explain to us, is there something wrong with the airport and airway trust fund where we need to change the, the system by which we are supposed to be replenishing it? Um, yes, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think there's an issue here about what pricing does, and I think the American economy was built up on market principles and pricing. And the importance of pro direct pricing is that it um, basically, as I, as I said, it uh, indicates where uh, it allocates what you've got, it indicates where you need more or less, and it provides resources for doing so. The fuel tax is a tax. There's no direct link between the fuel charge and the actual use of the system in the sense uh, depending on how far you fly, where you fly, and so on, uh, that's not directly linked to the actual cost of providing air traffic control services and airports. There is a linkage, I agree with you, but the linkage is a little bit akin to the fuel tax on roads. Uh, the fuel tax on roads is the same uh, per gallon, irrespective of whether you're driving in the center of congested Washington or up in the middle of uh, West Virginia. The charge is the same. It does not reflect the cost of the system you're using. And by reflecting the cost of what you're using, you're making sure resources are properly, uh, properly deployed. My, my view on the charging is the whole thing needs to be looked at, and we move forward to a system where you have direct charging for what you use. This is gradually taking place in the road services where we have tolls and so on, which are beginning to actually reflect the use made of the system and the quality of the system. You're going to pay more to go on the Beltway at... Uh, 70 miles an hour, and possibly even in Texas you can drive at 85 miles an hour. It's mooted if you pay enough. That may be a little extreme. Uh, but the, the, the fact is you get the people using it who gain most from it. But that's state, like the Florida Turnpike, New Jersey Turnpike, Pennsylvania. You know, you're talking about something that's federal now. You're well, talking what, 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 may I ask you a question then, sir? What is the difference economically between a federally supplied facility and a state supply. Well, what I'm trying to ascertain is what is broken with this trust fund system that we need to go from what we have with a fuel-based system where we can, you know, initiate legislation. Where I'm sure that we can raise the taxes on, on the fuel and, and to this $100. And I'd also like to know who came up with $100. Um, well, the, the answer to your second question is actually also posed in my, my written evidence. I mean, it's a number. It could be 95, 250. There doesn't seem to be any uh, rhyme or reason to go with that particular number. I think the system is and that's, that's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> there was no rhyme or reason. If yeah. someone in the federal bureaucracy just came up with a dollar amount, I don't, did they consult with any of the, the users out there? See, th I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a problem going around looking for a solution. Well, but what you do have, I think, is a need for additional revenue for the FAA. And perhaps you do need some form of a additional charge. I would personally remove the fuel charge and in some way have a direct user charge, which may, you know, amount to this combination of the two sums of money. It may not. But different types of aviation use the system in different ways, and that should be reflected. It should be reflected in the price they pay. I take the point that general aviation and business aviation is important. I've done work on small airports in Virginia, and it's quite clear they contribute significantly <coughs> to the local economy. So, I don't disagree at all with any of the, my colleagues here. It's very, very important. But it's also important to use it wisely and sensibly. And you've got to remember small businesses use 
general aviation and business aviation, they also use commercial aviation. I imagine the bulk of small businesses in this country actually use uh, commercial aviation. And you have to have the appropriate balance between the two to, to benefit small business in its entirety in this country and not simply look at the suppliers of uh, aviation services. Real quickly, what, what would this do to your profit margins if we went to this $100? Our profit margins would just diminish. It really would kill the general aviation community. Pilots already shop around for the cheapest fuel price they can get because it's a commodity. And when you whop a $100 departure tax, and my assumption would be it's to take off and to land, um, it's just going to add incrementally to your cost and drive people away from using aviation. And once people are driven away from using aviation, jobs are lost. And revenues, for example, at our county airport are going to just fall off the cliff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back because I'm over time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bolton, clearly there is a large difference um, in prices that commercial airlines and corporate jets pay for using the same level of air traffic services. Do you believe that this is... Um, that this difference is too great and should be reduced, whether through fuel taxes, user fees, or some other mechanism? I believe it should be reduced. I don't think they necessarily should pay the same, because I think the commercial aircraft demand additional facilities not required by uh, general aviation or business planes. So I don't think they necessarily pay the same, but I think the differential is extremely large. And I think one reason for this is the commercial air business uh, in a sense, generates more revenue and therefore is seen as a mechanism for raising more money, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily the most efficient way of allocating resources. Mm -hmm. So I certainly think they should be closed. By how much I think requires a serious study, okay. uh, but there should be some closing of that gap Thank in you. some way or the other. It, it appears that both uh, the current system of uh, fuel taxes and the proposed user fees do not um, result in accurate prices. If you were to design a pricing system from the beginning and did not have any uh, constraint in doing so, would you build off the current fuel tax system or start fresh based on a user-free approach? I, I would go to a user-free approach. I think there may be reasons for taxation on aviation to do with environmental implications, which we're not talking about here, I don't think. But for using the system, I think people should pay for what they use. Uh, that is quite common in virtually every other part of the, the economy. Given the concerns uh, that were raised by the witnesses here regarding user fee that is too onerous, um, uh, that it creates another bureaucracy, that compliance uh, will create a problem for them, uh, what is your reaction to that? Uh, the reaction to the latter one on the administration is I would get rid of the fuel surcharge and the and the takeoff fee and have one simple charging mechanism, which can be metered on the aircraft and you get a bill like your telephone bill. I don't, that's not beyond the, 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 the wisdom of man, and we do it on the tollways anyway. This mechanism is there. So the, the actual administrative charge is a once and for all and not very large change in the mechanism, in my view. Let's talk about uh, sequestration for a moment. Mm. You know, it's later to begin in January, and the FFA stands to lose $1 billion from its budget. It has been estimated that air traffic services will have to be curtailed significantly. If this does occur, how would you recommend the FFA go about determining where it should reduce air traffic control services? My problem is with the current system of charging, I've got no indicator of where the best parts of the system are. Mm. We the charging system doesn't actually tell you where the largest demands are. So you've got no mechanism. Uh, I could sit down and do some econometric work and by training an econometrician, uh, but I would imagine my results would be far off the mark, mm -hmm. uh, these analyses are. They have a major problem of finding a billion dollars, and I think uh, uh, how you actually cut it back, I think the, probably the best way would simply be to ask the guys at the FAA who have everyday contact with the industry, and you get a rough and ready answer. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Epps, uh, I gather from your testimony that you support uh, raising fuel taxes <coughs> instead of uh, user fee, given the fact that it hasn't been raised Excuse um, me. for quite a while. Yes, Ranking Member Velasquez, they have not been raised in over 20 mm -hmm. years, 
and the current system of collecting the tax in the fuel is the most efficient system. It would eliminate any additional administrative costs. Okay. If we have a shortfall and sequestration takes uh, effect, will you support raising uh, fuel tax? That would be the preference over okay. Ms. King? a new user fee. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, that would be the preference. And I disagree with Dr. Button that fuel charges uh, are not related uh, directly to the use of the system, because the more an aircraft flies and the more sophisticated it is and the more it needs uh, the, the airline type airports, the more fuel it is going to use and the more tax it will pay. Uh, Dr. Button, would you like to respond? I don't disagree with that, but I'd like to have a much closer correlation between the two. Mm. Uh, that's absolutely true. As I said, there is some correlation. The correlation, though, I think is not particularly clear, and I think that needs clarifying, and I think the charges should be closer to the costs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pierce, what is your position regarding if we face a shortfall, uh, how would we be if able there, to make it? If there is a, a shortfall and Congress votes to to raise these fees. Uh, I would, and the fees are coming in some form or another. Then I would prefer it to be in a fuel tax. In in our case, we pay quite a bit of of taxes into the system. <coughs> I I fly as I mentioned to 49 states. I fly extensively. Therefore, I'm paying a lot more than the people who fly locally. And so I feel that. What you're stating is that you will support uh, raising fuel tax. I I would support. I would support that if a tax is voted on and is approved by Congress, that then at that point I would, would prefer the tax so that's to be a yes in the fuel. To my question. I do not uh, specifically advocate that we, without knowing the facts and knowing what, the, what this amount is, I can't blanketly say that we should or should not raise a specific tax. My, my, my question was a simple one. Right. If we are out of money, how are we going to make up for the shortfall? Either I, we impose user fee or we raise fuel taxes. I, I think that it's it's more complex in, in looking at how people use the system. When the system is is built for the airline industry, we may need to raise their taxes at a different rate than we raise general aviation taxes. Is my personal opinion. Okay. But I, I think that it's more complex. Thank you. Um, for the record, I think all of the organizations here uh, were in full agreement with uh, uh, an increase in uh, aviation fuel taxes uh, when we went through the last round of taking a look at that in the Transportation Committee. Uh, Mr. Hanna. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Um, in the interest of disclosure, I am an AOP member, a, a pilot. I have watched your videos, uh, Ms. King. Uh, you are actually good on videos. We great here today. Um, the, uh, so thank you uh, for being here, everyone. If the assumption is, uh, and that doesn't bias me, I think it gives me certain in input and, and insights. Um, although it may bias me, I'm also an airport owner. Um, it's kind of the law of uh, the bigger fool theory. I bought one, lost a lot of money, and sold it to another guy who had more money than me, uh, and I'm happy about it. But the, in the, it, what possible reason, uh, Mr. Button, do you, Dr. Button, do you have to think that? Um, Money, dis money collected nationally, hundred dollars, this that at one airport or another, um, will make it distributed more fairly or um, more properly, as you put it. There's, there's not a lot of evidence. I mean, if you take, for example, the transportation bill, uh, which is uh, very much underfunded, um, we have a formula. The formula doesn't necessarily go. So, I mean, I, w I question your major premise that that, that would be an outcome. First of all, I agree with you entirely about the allocation of the transportation bill. It is not uh, an ideal mechanism. Um, in this case, um, I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of assuming, and this is a strong assumption, the FAA acts sensibly and rationally. And the FAA is a public agency which should serve the public. It's getting revenue in. It knows where the revenue is coming from. Therefore, it should direct its investments to areas where there's a large amount of revenue and there's a clearly demand for the services in that area. That is a rather strong assumption I will agree with, um, but if it was, I'm treating it as a private business. A private business, uh, many air traffic control systems in the world and, and airports now are corporatized, or in the British case, uh, semi-privatized. 
Uh, they have signals from the fees they get, where the investment's needed, required. But let's, uh, I appreciate that, but let's, uh, let's be honest, it's subjective, and there's very little evidence about throughout this country that every dollar we collect from the states, we send back, if they're lucky, some smaller, much smaller percentage of it. This won't change this. We have a mechanism that works perfectly well that is, as, as Ms. King said, bigger planes that require more runway, more everything, they burn a hell of a lot more fuel. And there's not necessarily a relationship between the number of times you take off and land and, and the amount you actually use. But there is a much more direct correlation with the fuel uh, in that regard. Well, it's true, but you may, t you may expend more fuel take on taking off and landing, but are you incurring the same proportional change in the infrastructure which is needed? That's the question. But that's a question that that doesn't necessarily answer. I mean, you can still, uh, the fuel tax can still take that, can still uh, account for that. Well, and we know where fuel is collected. We know uh, every airport that, uh, so we also have a system to do exactly what you want to do, which is recognize how much money was collected at what airport, and they can allocate it already without this uh, additional bureaucracy. I can tell you within, within, give me a day, and I can tell you how much fuel was burned at every airport in America. Yes, I, I can do that as well. The, the, but the, the point is that you have the ability to allocate it now. We do have the, but you've also got to link this to cost. At the moment, the allocations are not done that way. If you take a large jet into an airport, you sure as heck burn a lot more fuel and collect more revenue. But the costs of that jet landing are not the same as a, a smaller jet that coming in, which burns less fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, you collect less money from the smaller jet. It takes up the same length of runway. It takes up basically the same amount of air traffic control. Well, actually, time. you're wrong about that. It doesn't take well, up the same length of runway. You're, you're right. The, the shorter amount. But uh, that's my point, by the way, in response to the earlier question. You would have a differential rate for different types of aircraft. They would not be brought together. There would be a gap. I'm listening carefully to you, and I, I, I believe you believe this. I, having flown a lot in my life, I, I frankly um, find no benefit to adding this additional bureaucracy and no, no added ability to allocate differently or more thoughtfully. Uh, and uh, just the opportunity, though, to eat up a bigger piece of revenue through bureaucracy that we don't have yet. Well, I would simply substitute, I, I would simply get rid of the existing charges and have a direct user charge with one bureaucracy. Do you want to eliminate the gas tax? I, well, eliminate, I, I, I think you should have char you should pay for what you use in a society, and in that sense, you tend not to get overspending too often. You don't run up large deficits too often. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, it seems like we're off into academic exercises and thoughtfulness. And that's excellent. And I guess one thing I take from this uh, is that at some point, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, be interesting to have uh, general aviation, uh, the FAA, and others participate in a, some sort of thoughtful discussion and or study of is there a better way uh, to allocate uh, the costs of general aviation. Uh, and I think that would be fine. Uh, I'm don't know enough about, I'm a pilot, but uh, I, I'm a four to six seater plane, so I'm not even going to pay any of these things at the end of the day, so maybe I should be in favor of the new fee. But uh, general aviation obviously has come out in favor of uh, not doing this. And uh, based on the ranking member's questions, they're inclined, if there has to be a fee, uh, that they'd prefer to do the, the fuel tax. And so I guess I'm just country doctor from, you know, Western Oregon. And you know, if that's what the industry wants and they're willing to pay for it, regardless of perceived inequities, you know, to balance our budget and help things go forward. We have a problem right now. Now, sequester would be horrible, but uh, we've got a de deficit problem right now. And uh, while I think Mr. Dr. Button has a good point, it's not, we're not going to balance the budget on the aviation industry. If everyone pays the team a little bit, which I think Americans are willing to do, their fair share, I think we've come a long way to fixing our country's problems. So, uh, you know, I, just to comment more on the question, Mr. Chairman, I think, you know, the industry itself has come up with a reasonable solution. It seems like most of the panel is moderately interested in that solution. I think most of us are interested in that solution. Maybe that's a suggestion we can make to the administration to uh, not, not cause a problem, but let's help the industry do what it does best, which is fly people around, create jobs, and be market and, and uh, job builders for our great country, and just have it where uh, we do some adjustment of the, the, the gas fee, the uh, avgas fee, and the jet fuel fee for right now, and then let's study the problem and figure out if we have a better long-term solution. So I, just a comment, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple of things that I just uh, I'm, I don't fly uh, at all. I have a few friends that fly. I do make a, a pretty mean pizza. Uh, at least that's that's what they tell me. Uh, but but here's what uh, one of my concerns uh, is: the fact that this will create another government agency when we already have a system in place. And uh, I guess this question is to uh, to Dr. Button: is that the analogy of the bigger plane, or or just the the statement on the bigger plane landing on the runway? versus the smaller plane. The bigger plane is going to use a lot more fuel, therefore pay more in taxes. Uh, and, you know, I don't believe that they do make the, the uh, same impact on the airports when they're landing or taking off. Uh, specifically, I guess, would be taking off. It would be like saying uh, the Ford Escort versus the semi-truck using the road. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's kind of that idea. But the, the one thing that I look at is, you know, we've got pretty much everybody here agreeing that they're willing to pay more in the fuel tax, uh, just like Mr. Schrader said. Um, you know, so one of my concerns, again, also is the fact that um, you know, we're going to start out with a number out of the hat, 100 bucks. Where does it go? And, and I do have a young man um, that I guess what do I tell the 18-year-old kid that's trying to get his, uh, he's starting to fly, and that every time he's going to take off or land, it's going to cost him a couple hundred bucks. Um, you know, I think we're discouraging new pilots for uh, long term down the road. Uh, th that gets pretty expensive, especially on, for, for some, some young, young folks that are out there. But um, I mean, I mean what, when I go back home this weekend, what, what do I tell this 18-year-old pilot with the $100 fee? How do I, how do I sell that to him? Um, well, first of all, we need to tell him to enroll in a new degree. We're going to have a George Mason where you can uh, get credits for acquiring a pilot's license, so you can get a, a plus from that. Um, I think the point is very much, I mean, I understand, I'm, I'm, I'm the academic here, therefore I'm putting forward the academic perspective because I think we'd, we'd have a, a sort of consensus without me here. And I also do believe there are news of charges. From a pragmatic short-term point of view, you may want to raise fuel taxes. The administration's in. That's easy. That does not avoid the arbitrariness of the system, though. You're talking about $100 being arbitrary. How much are you going to raise the fuel tax by? What amount? That's equally arbitrary. No, it's not. Oh, excuse me. Well, it, it, but why isn't it? I mean, if you want to raise a certain sum of money, then you can... You, it, it's, not, you, you've got, it's, it's arbitrary in the sense, if you push up the fuel tax, you're going to raise a sum of money. You have a target sum of money you want to raise, you raise the fuel tax to get that target sum of money. So you've got to have the target sum of money. Ditto when you have the $100, you've got a target sum of money, $1.2 billion, I believe. Um, that's a target. So the target is there whichever way you go. Both are arbitrary. Um, as for your son, um, I think you ought to say yeah, it's a great future in aviation, that the aviation industry is growing, and that... Uh, in the longer term, if the economy picks up, uh, there will be a lot of opportunities for flying, and you will uh, be earning a large salary, perhaps producing pizzas and flying them around. I don't know. Very good. Uh, next uh, question, Mr. Pierce, uh, the small business you're in. Um, being a small business, what, the one thing that's very frustrating is uh, we work on fractions. Uh, it's, you know, you're running this business, you're paying uh, you know, utilities, rent, what have you. The government continues to come in and want to take another piece of that fraction. Um, you know, between the regulations and everything going on, I mean, do you find that uh, you know, that's, that's a big, big problem within your business? Absolutely. The, the social cost of doing business is, is perhaps one of our largest challenges. Uh, the, the economy has obviously hurt our industry and, and a lot of my, my competitors, as I've mentioned, and you're so focused on trying to, to just to work to serve your customers and to, to do what you need to do to, to take care of your employees and allow them to have good places to, to come to work and, and grow as individuals and, and care for their families. And more and more regulations just tend to, to keep kind of poking their, their nose in where more and more time is spent not only looking at the regulations, but also determining what cost uh, to, to allocate in terms of or budgetary items for accountants and lawyers and everybody else to make it so that a small business person like myself can understand all of these new charges and regulations and how to properly comply with them. And I think that when we, we look at, at things like the administrative cost of, of this new proposal, this would add to that burden in addition to the other social costs we are already incurring. Does your food service company absorb that cost or do you pass it on to your customers? 
we have have absorbed to some degree as much as as we can. You take part of the pain, and, and eventually you you figure out that if you take all the pain, you're going to go out of business yourself. So that has been passed uh, along to our end user customers and increased obviously their costs for equipment and their costs for services, which is then revenue that they can't use to pay to grow their own companies. That they pass on to their customers yes, also. So absolutely. The, the bottom line is all of these fees go down to the hardworking people across the United States of America. With that, I yield back. Thank you, sir. A couple points of clarification. Um, in, in the hearings about uh, the proposed user fee, the $100 user fee that the administration is putting forth, which is purely, it, it is, what it is is revenue mining, uh, plain and simple. Um, there is no indication whatsoever that this money is going to go to the airport trust fund. There is none. It goes into general revenue. Um, an increase in fuel taxes, however, or fuel taxes going to general, uh, or into the uh, general aviation trust fund to pay for infrastructure uh, that we use on our uh, on our airport. So what this is is revenue mining on the administration's part, and it would cripple um, aviation. But I do have a question uh, from Mr. or Dr. Button on uh, in terms of uh, uh, paying for what you use or or uh, you know making it equitable how you're going to do it. And you would have a different fee structure, I guess, for different aircraft. But if you just take um, if you take two different uh, uh, daily operations and you take a crop duster out there that's flying a, an air tractor, uh, which is a turbine, and he makes 50 takeoffs and 50 landings in one day but never exceeds 200 feet above ground level, and you've got a King Air that takes off from point B to, or point A to point B, um, and, uh, you know, he pays that $100 fee, whatever it is, and that crop duster pays that $100 fee for all 50 uh, of those operations. Um, how is that equitable And that crop duster never accesses the system, nor does he use the air traffic control system? Um, and how can you argue that that is an equitable system, but a fuel charge is not? Um, I entirely agree with you. I don't think that is equitable. Um, I think the issue is that there should be a charging system to reflect the fact one chap is doing 50-odd trips. Um, the charge would probably not be that large because he is not using air traffic control facilities in, the la in that sense. Those that fly higher do, therefore their fees would be higher, um, and that would be you know, based on the, the actual cost of using the system. Um, the, the problem with any fixed charge is it is largely arbitrary, and this is true of uh, the, uh, the $100. It is an arbitrary number. The, the cutoff point for what aviation types pay and don't pay is also arbitrary. So there is a certain arbitrariness about that. So I am very much in favor of a general user charge. How much does it cost for that plane in terms of the costs imposed on the FAA and the other providers of air, air transport infrastructure, the airports, which may be zilch in the case of a crop duster taking off from a field, or it may be large in the case of a large commercial aircraft. It should pay for the appropriate costs of using the airport and the air traffic control system. Just like if we go and purchase anything else, we pay the cost of producing it. And if we, a lot of us want it, the price goes up, and we, uh, the supplier supplies more. There are signals in the pricing mechanism. That is the way the American system works. Uh, Apple uses it pretty well, and they're the most successful company in the world. Well, how do you uh, then? How do you account for the rest of the general aviation out there? The non-turbine aircraft, the piston-powered aircraft, the weekend well, flyers. I think yeah, it's, it's like, like anything else. There should be an appropriate charge for them if they use any any uh, publicly provided facilities. If they've used a private airfield, that's their own cost. If they don't use any form of uh, air traffic control facilities, that's not a cost on the nation. Uh, but if they do, they should pay. Well, my question, you mentioned, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, you just meter this by, you know, that takeoff and you get a bill in the mail for, uh, for that takeoff. How on earth are you ever going to police something like this and, and put a bureaucracy in place to try to account for that and decide who's taking off from a private field, who's not taking off from a private field, when you have aviation uh, fuel taxes that pretty much account for that? Well, the aviation fuel taxes, if you're taking, why are you paying an aviation fuel tax if you're taking off from your own field and not using up any controlled airspace? I mean, uh, why should you pay the government for that, faci that facilities uh, which you're not using? I've got some sympathy. I think, you know, in the case of general aviation taking off from a private field, landing uh, and flying through you know, uncontrolled airspace, you're not using any national resources. I, I would sympathize. There should be no payment for that. Okay, let's take out uh, you know private airfields and just talk about small airfields. 
small airfields, if they're, pri if, they're, if they're privately owned, the private company owning them presumably would pay an appropriate late takeoff landing fee. Very, um, very, very few. I'm talking about municipal airports. The Oops. vast majority of airports in this country, municipal, county yep. owned. Um, well, presumably the, the airport, to which uh, someone has to pay for that airport somewhere along the line, uh, why not pay directly for the facilities used? We do this in virtually every other thing we do in society. But isn't Certainly that, you don't do it perfectly. Let's, you know, I'm not. But isn't that exactly what fuel charges do, is pay directly for, uh, for the use of You pay directly facility? for the fuel you use, but you may have a, a runway of a certain length, which two mm. aircraft of slightly different sizes use, uh, one burning more fuel than the other. Um, therefore, one pays more tax than the other one, but they're using exactly the same facility. Well, see, that then, then in, you get right back into the situation, which you know, you're going to have to put a bureaucracy in place, which is going to cost money, just to be able to determine if, you know, how much a, a Stinson 108 uses as opposed to a Gulfstream, uh, how much runway they're going to use. I accept, I accept there's a bureaucratic cost. I think I'd get rid of the existing charges, which would reduce the burden of that. But a lot of the charges are not, uh, do not involve actually the, the federal system, to the point, in fact, over here, because a lot of the, a lot of the uh, airports are owned by state or municipal authorities. And the airport themselves presumably should act commercially in the way they set their fees. Yep. It's the air traffic control, which is, as far as I can see, the primary issue, which is the FAA. Um, before we have a vote, a series of votes coming up, and I'd like to ask if you'd like to weigh in at all, anyone else, on, on what I've asked Ms. King. Yes, I'd like to uh, address the fact, uh, as Dr. Button's pos uh, position was taken by the head of um, the FAA equivalent in Australia, and what they did is pursue exactly that philosophy that uh, if you're out in the outback and you're not coming into town, uh, why should you be paying fuel taxes? We'll get rid of the fuel taxes and we'll put in user fees at all the towered airports. They did that. It has been devastating. Um, the airports, uh, the philosophy was that with the user fees, the pilots using the airports will have an incentive to control the costs that are being charged to them. But the power is so unequal between the government and an individual pilot that that is not an effective mechanism. It, does, it did not work, and I don't believe that it will work. And it has been devastating to flight training organizations in areas like Sydney and, and many other places up and down the East Coast where they did flight training. What is left in Australia has moved inland away from the air traffic system. The point is that air traffic is a national transportation resource, and even the um, the, the air tractor that is flying out of a crop duster field and uh, not taking off and landing from an airport with a tower, that pilot trained somewhere. Uh, the aircraft was built and certified by the FAA. There is a whole lot of FAA cost and national uh, cost involved in it, and I think that the national fuel system is the best way to pay for it. Um, the, the, run, the issue of the runway and a person, uh, a big airplane versus a small airplane landing on it, the runway is the length that it is, the longer length in smaller towns because they want the bigger business aircraft there. And so they pay more for essentially compensating the, the municipality for being willing to finance that big a, of a runway. I want to apologize to... Mr. Mulvaney, for not getting to uh, your questions. I want to apologize for uh, the vote series that we have. It's going to probably take, because we've got a motion to recommit in there, and it's probably going to take about an hour. So unfortunately, I'm probably going to go ahead and adjourn the hearing so you all don't have to sit around uh, and wait on us uh, to do our job. But I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, it is very evident, uh, and 195 of my colleagues, um, which signed the letter that imposing a per-flight user fee on operations in the aviation industry is a very bad policy. 
Um, it's going to add to an already massive federal bureaucracy and it's going to create a lot of unnecessary financial and regulatory burdens on small businesses. My job and the job of this committee is going to be to watch very carefully what happens um, when we do a uh, uh, omnibus bill at the end of the year, spending bill, to make sure that user fees are not in that particular piece of legislation and to watch when it comes to sequestration, which we will have a hearing uh, in this committee on sequestration uh, this week, in fact, tomorrow, and we'll have another hearing on next week and another hearing on uh, the financial cliff that, uh, uh, that's coming. Um, but we were going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, user fees are not included in any end-of-the-year spending measures. Um, and with that, I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Um, with that objection, that is so ordered. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. I appreciate very much uh, all of the witnesses for coming today.